<clears throat> Comment by the author. Controversial was the label pinned on this book's first edition. And why shouldn't it be? The main allegations it set out to controvert were live issues in 1946. The belief that man cannot be healthy on meat alone to a high age had by then perhaps already disappeared from the medical schools, but it was still widely held by the public, who for the most part still clung to the opinion that a high meat percentage in the diet was harmful and that meat or its effect had to be diluted with things like carbohydrates. The last belief really meant that our forebears must have lived on a food pernicious to them through the eons, the million or so years which preceded agriculture. For it is the consensus of the applicable sciences and of history that before agriculture most men lived most of the time by hunting and fishing and by gathering things like eggs, shellfish, grubs, berries in season, and a few roots and salad type vegetables all of which would bulk large, but would not yield many calories. As to how things were before and after the coming of agriculture, in the usual view of historians and scientists, which are background to our book, and especially to this new edition, we quote from a recent and fascinating article by Johannes Iverson, anthropologist and botanist, in the magazine Scientific American of March 1956, Forest Clearance in the Stone Age. The article begins, Perhaps the single greatest step forward in the history of mankind was the transition from hunting to agriculture. In the Mesolithic age, men lived by the spear, the bow, and the fishing net. The change came independently at different times in different parts of the world. Historians and archaeologists believe generally that the shift from the hunter diet, mainly of meat, to the gradually increasing carbohydrate blend of the agriculturist came less than 15,000 years ago in China and the Near East, 5,000 years ago in Greece and Italy, 2,000 years ago in England, Julius Caesar saw agriculture being introduced there by the Belgic settlers, and only 1,500 years ago in Scotland. If meat needs carbohydrate and other vegetable additives to make it wholesome, then the poor Eskimos were not eating healthfully till the last few decades. They should have been in a wretched state along the north coast of Canada, particularly at Coronation Gulf, when I began to live among them in 1910 as the first white man most of them had ever seen. But, to the contrary, they seemed to me the healthiest people I had ever lived with. To spread abroad the news of how healthy and happy they and I were on meat alone was a large pan of the motive for writing this book. We do not disagree with Iverson's, quote, perhaps the greatest single step forward in the history of mankind was the transition from hunting to agriculture, end quote, but we think an interpretation is needed. Carbohydrate, gift of the fanner to us, makes civilization possible. For now we produce many times more food on a unit of land. We have large families and leisure. We have built cities. But to make this a clear gain to man, it is necessary for him to turn a great pan of the carbohydrate into meat and milk by feeding it to his stock. Otherwise, he suffers in individual health and in happiness, for the unhealthy are unhappy. And carbohydrates, as this book helps to explain, are not conducive to optimum health at least not if taken as a high percentage of the meal. A distinguished orthodontist has said, in a passage we quote more at length here after, that the Eskimos, quote, are paying for civilization with their teeth, end quote. And, as this book means to show, the decay of teeth is only one of several important losses in health we suffer as a price of that food abundance which enables us to dwell in large cities and have a, quote, high standard of living. Because of limited space, we confine ourselves from here on to comment on those two of our original 13 chapters that have proved most controversial. These chapters we attempt to bring up to date 
within the space allowed. They are the fifth. And visit your dentist twice a year, which, although no longer so controversial, needs some amplification. And the sixth, living on the fat of the land, which needs both addition of material and consideration of strong attacks against some of its contentions. In chapter five, we consider only two points. What the first edition says about lack of tooth decay among Eskimos as long as they were on a hunter diet exclusively of meat, and what it says about the Icelanders having been without dental caries cavities during that part of their history, about 600 years, when they were on a herdsman diet, that is, on meat plus milk. We take Iceland first because the new evidence there is more readily condensed. There never were Aborigines in Iceland, and the blood of the present population stems mainly from Ireland and Norway, with a total of probably less than 10% from Denmark, England, Scotland, and Sweden. From the beginning of the firmly historical period around 870 until after 1100, Iceland had material commerce with Europe and imported some carbohydrates. Recent excavations of churchyards and other burial places reveal traces of a little tooth decay. But after 1100, when commerce is considered to have ceased, there was no tooth decay. Nor does any appear until after 1800, the approximate renewal date by Iceland of modern commerce with Europe. This information came to me in a letter from Christian Eldjar, director of the National Museum in Reykjavik, Iceland. <clears throat> he says it is now, in 1955, considered definitely established that there were, was no dental decay during those 600 years anywhere in Iceland. Today's dietary there is about that of England or of New England, and the dental decay rate is similar, with the regulation dentistry, toothbrushing, hard chewing of food for the good of the teeth, and the like, all of course with little result. During the decay-free period, 1200 to 1800, the foods of the Icelanders were, in descending caloric importance, caloric importance, milk and milk products, mutton, beef, fish. There were, as we said, no imported carbohydrates. The only local non-animal food of any importance was, and then only in some places, soups made of Iceland moss. The moss, really a lichen, had to be secured by long journeys to the mountains, which journeys, the literature shows, were summer picnics, made more for fun than for food. It is Pelion upon Essa, the carrying coals to Newcastle, and to harp on it with an anthropologist that the tooth of a meat-eater never decays. He's saying that uh, most anthropologists know this. Meat-eaters don't have cavities. But the medical and related professions have seemed little impressed. Recently, However, signs of a new trend have come from the, from the dentists, more especially perhaps from the orthodontists, for honors are descending on heretics who claim that, for healthy teeth, diet is more important than the toothbrush. An example is the belated recognition of Dr. Lumen M. Wow of the School of Dental and Oral Medicine, Columbia University, whose heresies, like many of my own, were derived from seeing what the European way of life is doing to the Eskimos. During his early days, Dr. Waugh made trips for five summers to Labrador and discovered about tooth decay, what Dr. William A. Thomas of Chicago was then discovering there about rickets. Caries, like rickets, was worse where European foods were most eaten. Again, caries means cavities. I didn't know that until I started reading this book, or maybe a different book, but it's a, an old word for cavities. Both troubles were nearly or quite absent, cavities and rickets, both troubles were nearly or quite absent where European goods were unknown or negligible. Later, 
through a number of seasons, Dr. Wow had similar opportunities for study in Alaska, where he found like evidence and drew like conclusions. Through the expedient of living to a high age, Dr. Wall has managed to be honored in his time and even by his own profession. As witness the Daily Globe of May 1956, Dr. Wall received the Albert H. Ketchum Memorial Award, highest honor of the American Association of Orthodontists, now holding their 52nd annual session at the Statler. Among the points of Dr. Waugh's address to the more than 1,200 members and guests were these, according to the Globe. Quote, Eskimos who'd never been exposed to civilization had the best teeth in the world. Civilization. <laughs> but they have been paying for civilization with their teeth. No Eskimo ever had decayed teeth until he got the white man's diet. Eskimos have filthy mouths, too. Not much evidence there that keeping the mouth clean has anything to do with the lack of cavities. But while these honors were in preparation and the month before they were awarded, Columbia University more or less placed itself on record as still safely in the camp of the avoid carries by hard chewing school. For under date of April 1956, the Columbia Reporter had a paragraph in its Morningside Mention page. Quote, Clues to dental caries were hunted recently among the Amazon Indians by Drs. Hartz Newman and Nicholas DeSalvo of the Faculty of Medicine. Their findings corroborate their theory that resistance to tooth decay is related primarily to the pressure load placed on the teeth i.e. that chewing with great pressure on hard foods results in work hardening, which causes teeth to become more resistant. In the 1946 edition, our chapter, Living on the Fat of the Land, made a point of the high favor in which the Bible holds fat meats. We recited from the Book of Moses the account of the first recorded offering to Jehovah, where Cain brought vegetables and Abel the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And how, quote, the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but to Cain and to his offering he had not respect, End quote. The Cain and Abel story reports the Lord of hosts direct in the fourth chapter of Genesis. In Genesis 45, 17 through 18, we learn by inference that both Jews and Egyptians thought well of a high-fat diet. And Pharaoh said unto Egypt, <laughs> quote, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Take your father and your households and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat of the fat of the land. Our chapter tells also how we consulted eminent Bible scholars, in particular Dr. Edgar J. Goodspeed, and his colleagues in Chicago, and learned their conviction that in this and similar passages, the Old Testament Hebrews were thinking of fat mutton, or of mutton suet, when they spoke of the fat of the land. And in case you don't know, mutton is, is lamb, meat. Um, the Old Testament Hebrews were thinking of fat mutton, or of mutton suet, when they spoke of the fat of the land. Pursuing the topic, we quoted Isaiah 25, 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, of fat things full of marrow. And not disagreeing with the scholars that usually such biblical quotations have in mind of the fat meats and suets of mutton, we went on to show that beef fat was also held in high esteem. For, in the New Testament, when a father welcomed home his prodigal son, he did not butcher an ordinary calf, he slew a fatted calf. In view of developments retailed hereafter, we have since gone a bit further into biblical matters. We were able to do it more easily because, fortunately, a colleague here at Dartmouth College has assumed the task of writing articles on food for the Interpreter's Bible. 
dealing with foods both in their everyday and in their ritual aspects. The first problem on which we consulted Dr. James F. Ross was interpreting the currently much cited Leviticus. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Ye shall eat no manner of fat, of ox, or of sheep, or of goat. We questioned, Is the Bible here saying for all men and for all circumstances that no one should ever eat these fats? Or is the meaning to prohibit these fats to certain people under certain circumstances? Dr. Ross said that he would like to study the case afresh. In view both of our interests and of his new work as a kind of food editor of a religious work for scholarly reference. But his preliminary view, based on the usual approach of Bible scholars to such problems, was it is here being directed that when these fats have once been offered in sacrifice, or when it is intended that they be so offered, then those concerned in the offering should not themselves partake. So we asked whether Leviticus 7.23 was then saying, in effect, don't be an Indian giver. When you have offered up in sacrifice delicious things, like the fats of the ox, sheep, and goats, don't try any such double-crossing trick as eating them yourself. Yes, said Dr. Ross, that was approximately his offhand opinion, pending further study of the special case. Some weeks later, we had a second talk with Dr. Ross. Though other, ma other matters had preoccupied him, he had a suggestion to look in the interpreter's Bible and take its verdict as his own, pending his further study. And these are among the things we found, written by Nathaniel Micklem. The context shows that Micklem is speaking of sacrificial meats. Quote, The fat is that which maintains life, and since life is God's gift and prerogative, man has no right over it. This commentary on Leviticus says also that the fat was the fat that was interlarded with the lean might be eaten. The commentator's emphasis here is on the much higher sacrificial rating of the clear suet, as distinguished from the fats that are streaked within the lean meat. This would be the importance of the words we now italicize from the fourth chapter of the first book of Moses. Abel brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, meaning that he brought not only fat meat but also separate fat or suet. Our chapter about living on the fat of the land makes a good deal out of the contradiction between the fashion of 1946 to warn against high-fat diets, as overheating in hot weather, and the uniformly opposed nature of anthropological and historical evidence. For the hottest countries are, in their lore and literature, the greatest praisers of fat. The Homeric poems are from relatively warm lands of long summers and resemble our scripture in having not a kind word for lean meat. But Homer, like the Bible, is full of praise for fat meats. An example is the Iliad's description of a repast spread for the demigod Achilles. Quote, Patroclus cast down a great fleshing block in the firelight and laid it thereupon a sheep's back and a fat goat's and a great hog's chine rich with fat. End quote. In contrast with Homer's account from Greece and the Bibles from still hotter Palestine and Egypt, are the religious and profane classics of northern European peoples preserved to us most extensively by the Scandinavian Eddas and Sagas. Our reading of these from childhood in the original fails to supply us with quotations in praise of fat to match those we find so easily in the subtropical books. As to current relish of fat, the tastes of the colder and the wanner lands vary, na vary now about as they used to. Within the relatively small geographic compass of the United States, it is apparent when New Englanders visit the Deep South and complain that the food there is greasy, we notice it still more when North Americans visit Latin America, for the complaints are louder. When the Fat Meats chapter appeared in 1946, we received mail from the tropics, 
plaintively asking why northerners fail to grasp the principle that for the hottest weather, the fattest foods are best. So, except perhaps in the deep south, our, our newspaper readers and radio listeners were no doubt generally bewildered in the summer of 1955 by the news that a professor in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology had recommended high-fat diets for hot weather. This was Dr. Robert S. Harris, Professor of Nutritional Biochemistry, Department of Food Technology. In a letter to us, he disclaims credit by saying he merely stated in his lecture, quote, a fact now well established that fats in food lower the specific dynamic action during digestion and metabolism, end quote. Technical science may not owe Dr. Harris a great deal in this particular regard, but the public owes him much, and so do scientists of other disciplines. For today, a specialist knows no jargon except his own, and in the gamut from astronomy to zoology, there is many a professor vague on the meaning of specific dynamic action in relation to foods in hot weather. But everybody knows what you mean when you say, in hot weather, fat foods are good for you. According to Thorstein Veblen, a function of each special jargon among scientists is to keep other disciplines from butting into your field. If they don't quite get what it is you are writing and talking about to criticize you and compete with you effectively. Meanwhile, for a greater reason, the layman also remains in the dark. Now the public, at least, is heavily in debt to Professor Harris and to newspapers and radio for getting specific dynamic action translated into the vernacular. In disclaiming credit, Harris cited Henry Clapp Sherman in his eighth edition of Chemistry of Food and Nutrition. He then cites Holman Lundberg Malkin, Progress in the Chemistry of Fats and Other Lipids. Academic Press, 1954. Quote, less energy is wasted as the fat content of the diet is increased. It goes on, and I quote, Forbes et al. suggest that it is not necessary to diminish the protein contents of the diet during hot weather in order to ensure a low heat increment. Rather, one need only substitute fat for some of the carbohydrate. That is the significance of the Arab practice when at 110 degrees and hotter in the shade, they eat fat mutton and use for a tidbit a hunk of the specially fat tails of their sheep. They are then taking advantage of the principle that fats and food lower specific dynamic action. Precept of Arab and principle of chemist did not mean much to most of us until someone like Dr. Harris translated for us into everyday speech and best of all into a slogan to give us fat foods for hot weather. Fat foods for the fat should be another of the slogans and is on the way toward becoming so through a series of tests and high fat diets performed at the instance of two of our largest corporations, the DuPont Company of Wilmington and the Lever Brothers Company of New York. DuPont tried their tests on vice presidents and other costly executives desiring to prolong their lives at a health level of increased efficiency, which sounds practical. Lever Brothers may have been still more practical when they managed to enlist 122 students of the Texas State College for Women. Instead of using corporate corporation dignitaries, such as my classmate and friend since the gay 90s, John M. Hancock, chairman of their board, who was a bit overweight the last time we saw him, and who may have a number of still fleshier associates among his presidents, vice presidents, and managers. We consider First, the less sensational, but to date more famous DuPont executives test. Our outline is drawn from three semi-accredited articles in Holiday Magazine, for many think of this as the Holiday Diet. Called on the magazine's cover the Eat All You Want Reducing Diet, the presentation was by Elizabeth Woody, based on information from those at DuPont, who were both on and in charge of the routine. Beside the nearly all-meat diet, the regimen was essentially a brisk half-hour walk in the morning, then ordinary duties the rest of the day, and a normal evening such as presumably is usual with corporation executives. The calories were apparently derived something over 20% from lean meat and something over 50% from fat, 
and something less than 30% from other things permitted, such as a small helping of baked potato, fresh fruit, or salad-type vegetables. According to Miss Woody, the reducing of the corpulent proved painless, even pleasant. Some said they were going to stick to the diet permanently. One of the many things that seem beyond doubt is that this proved the most successful magazine article Holiday had published to that date. According to one story, they reprinted and sold, at 10 cents a copy, more of Miss Woody's separates than there had been copies of the original June issue. After a year, the magazine ran a history, that far, of The All You, can, the All you Want Reducing Diet by Miss Woody. The cover of the magazine read, All About the Holiday Diet. And it was a tale of triumph. Perhaps because lean meat had, at the time, a better press than fat meat, it was played up as a high-protein diet. And indeed, it appeared high-protein, as we are aware from having spent a year, in 1928 to 1929, on its near equivalent, the Russell Sage diet, which served per day 28 to 30 ounces of lean meat, which, though they yielded only 50% of our energy, still appeared to be a huge pile alongside the eight or nine ounces of the fat from the edges of our sirloins, which gave us 80% of, of the calories. There's a typo here. So the first thing was 20%. They got 20% from protein, 80% from fat. Actually, the main energy sources of the DuPont holiday diet are similar to what ours were at Bellevue between lean and fat, with the mentioned token holiday servings of other things like salads, fruit, and baked potato. The greens and the fruits bulk even more than the lean, so that the fat meat in hol the holiday diet would not strike the naked eye. And fond as you are sure to become of the fat edges of the sirloin of your holiday diet, you, you eat them first, you begin with your meal with them, like a boy who begins by eating the butter off his bread, and scarcely notice that they are gone unless you hanker for more. Historically speaking, the lowdown on the holiday diet did not come until the magazine's issue for September 1951 in an article entitled Footnotes on the Eat All You Want Diet, subtitled More About the Exciting Never Feel Hungry a Way to Reduce. The article was by Earl Parker. When they say reduce, they mean lose weight. <laughs> the article was by Earl Parker Hansen, warmly introduced by Elizabeth Woody, Holiday's Consulting Food Editor. From it appear the outlines of a story which we tell, with a few variations and additions from other sources. Analyzing the Hansen presentation, we find the sequence of names might have been, chronologically, the Eskimo Diet, the Friendly Arctic Diet, the Blake Donaldson Diet, the Alfred W. Pennington diet, the DuPont diet, the holiday diet. Expanding a bit, while there were in pre-white times many Eskimos who used no vegetables, there were some, especially in Labrador and Alaska, who got as many calories from vegetables as the holiday diet does. So, even with a few things like lettuce and potato, we may well name this regimen for the Eskimos. The same diet is described in my 1921 book, Friendly Arctic, as used and enjoyed by whites who, like the Eskimos, found it non-fattening and thus a good reducing menu. When Dr. Blake Donaldson, successful New York physician, read the book and concluded that with a few things to make the regimen more acceptable, such as salad, fruit, and token potato, it would be a good reducing diet, and so it proved. A young disciple of Donaldson's was Alfred Pennington, and by the time the need arose for reducing DuPont's corpulent executives painlessly, he was already high in the corporation's medical setup and got a chance to try out what to him was the Blake Donaldson diet, as indeed it is, for the DuPont and holiday menus are substantially those developed in his obesity practice by Donaldson. All this is to us a friendly story. Blake Donaldson introduced himself somewhere back in the early 20s as we were going up in a New York skyscraper elevator and credited us, as he always has done, for giving his thinking a spur through the friendly Arctic book and thus to an extent influencing his obesity tactics and strategy. 
nor has Pennington been less generous, nor has anyone else been insufficiently generous to our view. The DuPont Company's triumph in health preserving and painless weight reducing of its executives with a high fat diet was reached through animal fats, chiefly with fat beef sirloins and roasts. The company is not in the business of selling food and had no commercial bias in the choice of fats, but Lever Brothers are merchants in vegetable oils. And naturally it was their presumably vegetable derived margarine which supplied the high fat element in the tests that they organized. So far as we know, the chief of those tests was on coeds, and the aim was broader. DuPont wanted to improve health with slimmer figures and got both. Lever Brothers wanted improved health, slimmer figures, and better complexions, and they got all three. So theirs was a greater triumph than DuPont's, but it came later, to which extent is only to which extent only is the lever firm behind. Physically, the success at Wilmington, Delaware, came in 1949 to 1950, and the large-scale publicity began with Holiday of June 1950. Physically, the success at Denton, Texas, came in the period before ni December of 1955, and the sensational publicity was at its height in December of 1955, and January of 1956. The low, medium, and moderately high fat nutrition tests of the Texas State College for Women were conducted by Dr. Pauline Beery Mack, who, before she became dean at Denton, won her, her nutritionist spurs in the East, notably at Pennsylvania State University. Instead of writing a whole chapter as we should like to do, we oversimplify in stating the Texas case. The girls in the Texas State College for Women at Dem at Demon, Demon, it's spelled spelled Demon. <laughs> the girls in the Texas State College for Women at Demon, mostly teenagers, were given the chance to volunteer to live for an extended period on one of three varieties of what is essentially the Basic Seven diet. The variation, as near as could be managed, being only in the percentage of calories derived from fat. Because many of the girl candidates thought the high-fat diet would be fattening, those inclined to stoutness tried to get into the low-fat group. The num a number of them were troubled with acne or other complexion difficulties, and many of these had been told to avoid fat. Still, it appears, there were, they were obesity-prone and complexion-troubled volunteers for all groups. So far as we know, the Denton test public the Denton test publicity has not been specialized in by any magazine, such as Holiday. Their publicity seems to have been thus far chiefly straight news stories, on the radio and in the press and on women's pages and in beauty and in food columns. Dean Mack summarized the results of the study for us in a letter of July 26, 1956. Quote, In the tests made at the Texas College for women, three controlled diets involving one of a moderately high fat content, one of an intermediate fat content, and one of a very low content of fat, showed that weight status was more easily retained, skin condition was superior, and fatigue resistance was better on the highest of the three fat levels, which involved between 30 and 35 percent of the total intake as fat. When margarine was one of the components of the total fat of the controlled diet, hemoglobin concentration, dark adaptation, and bone density undoubtedly related to the vitamin A content were superior. Perhaps we should not write up the teenager triumph at Denton along the line we are using. Dean Mack sent us voluminous and strikingly scientific material, but nothing new was demonstrated in her tests except the one thing that counts. Denton gained for moderately high-fat diets the publicity which the truth seems to require nowadays, perhaps more than in any previous age. Dean Mack got the attention of teenage girls, teenage college girls, who suffer acne. And the men's colleges are not going to be far behind, for boys have acne too. Boys don't worry so much over their figures in college, but they are going to when they get to be Lever or DuPont executives, 
and they too will bless Drs. Pennington and Mack. While teenagers were profiting by moderately high fat and blessings of the same tactics, blessings of the same tactics were spreading farther south and to lower ages in the University of Texas, for instance to their medical branch at Galveston, where Dr. Harold E. Hansen, chairman of the Department of Pediatrics, was improving the standard formulas by increased fat content, getting thereby less crying, sounder sleep, better results generally, as he wrote to us on May, on, in May and June 1956. And lest we forget, Texas was not the only progressive state in moderately high-fat diets. True, their releases were, to our knowledge, the first to point up the high fat in their successful diets. The Delaware announcements hid their fat under the name of meat, which to the general public means lean meat. Only when you scrutinize the holiday regimen, indeed only when you get your information from the Pennington direct or from his technical publications, do you see the importance of fat in the DuPont regimen, where its quiet role has like significance to its publicized one in the lever diet. As for the difference that the levers use vegetable fat and the DuPonts use animal, no one as yet has any experimental determination of what, if anything, that difference means to the health of the diners. Whether those are better off who specialize in fat on their sirloins or those who spread margarine thick on their bread or use it as shortening. True, it is claimed that margarine is cheaper. Not in our town. In Hanover, <coughs> in Hanover, New Hampshire, we pay for our margarine, but we get our suet without charge, as a kind of premium if we buy a trimmed steak. It seemed, then, a path of garlands for the high-fat regimens. My own skies were particularly rosy, for letters were coming in from the tropics in the deep south where they liked my books for saying fats are good in warm climates. Particularly I was set up when reporters, when reports told that my works, issued as popular, were breaking into the technical circles and were being mentioned, seldom with a sneer now, at medical conventions. Particularly, I was gratified that the Bellevue Hospital Test of 1928, where Anderson and I had lived for a year, deriving four out of every five energy units from animal fat, mostly beef and mutton, was being spoken of after three decades as a scientific milestone. High fat was riding high, and so was I with it, proudly. But pride goes before a fall, and what a fall there was, my countrymen. The first cloud in the sky was no bigger than a man's hand, in fact no larger than a brief and friendly personal note from Dr. Ansel Keyes, head of the Laboratory of Physiological Hygiene of the University of Minnesota, in which note he said that he was sending me a copy of his latest paper on dietetic fats. This did not sound ominous, for I remembered vividly the support he had given me in the course of the Second Pemmican War, which is chapter 13 of this book, and it, where it describes a dispute with some army <laughs> a dispute with some army physiologists who said the pemmican I favored as one sort of emergency ration had too much fat in it. Keyes had then written me that if pemmican contained no other ingredients than beef, fat, and lean, he thought as high as 80% of the calories from fat would probably be all right. He and I seemed pulling together on animal fats then, around 1944, but when I read his paper in 1954, I did not feel so sure anymore that in him we still had a potential booster for regimens like the DuPont and Lever Brothers diet. Doubtless, the storm had long been brewing, but I was preoccupied, and despite the Keyes paper, I awoke to the changed situation only with the near tragedy of our president's illness in Denver and the babble of discussion which followed, where now I heard from all sides that we were a nation in terrible straits, that a deadly sequence had been established. Heart disease is our chief cause of death, they said. The United States has more heart trouble than any other country. A high-fat diet is provocative of heart cases, and we are the heaviest fat eaters in the world. Luckily for my peace of mind, I was already past 75, half of that span living on the fat of the land more literally than most, and still sound of heart, according to a recent physical. 
except that presumably I should have been dead of heart failure long ago. I might have been frightened to death. Instead, I felt rather annoyed, thinking the Russ Sage, co the Russ Sage Battle of 1928 might have to be fought all over again. The attack on meat in the diet had been backed 50 years ago, had even been launched by men as prominent in their day as the viewers with alarm were today. In the 1920s and before, they had attacked meat because the lean element it contained, animal protein. Now they were attacking meat because of its fat element. Probably the great authorities of today are as wrong, I guessed, as the great were then. Everybody now praises the animal protein, which was so feared then. Very likely, within 20 years, everyone will be dithrambic once more about animal fats. That seemed to be a good bet. So, counter-suggestible as I am, when the dirges began to penetrate, I asked my wife if she thought it practical for me to abandon the, the Basic 7 diet on which, like nearly everyone, I had been living for years, and revert to the Russell Sage Bellevue Hospital diet of four energy units from beef or mutton fat for each unit from lean. She said this would simplify our housekeeping, and she thought save us money too, for the anti-fat campaign had been so pervasive in Hanover that considerate owners no longer fed scraps of fat to their dogs and cats. Instead, they bought for them rich lean meat. And the butchers, butchers <laughs> are hard put to give away fat. All we'd have to do for a 5,000 calorie diet was to buy 1,000 calories of lean and they would joyfully present us with 4,000 in fat. From bewildered meat sellers and in other ways, the news spread through Hanover that we were courting disaster at our house by gorging on fat meats. At least I was, and of course my wife was increasingly tempted to follow me. I began to feel somewhat healthier than before, which doubtless would have gone unnoticed at first except for my remembering how well Karsten Anderson and I used to feel in the Bellevue Hospital days. And there were other blessings. The first notable one of these came with my morning newspaper in a dispatch from Boston, which quoted Dr. Paul Dudley White, heart specialist to the president, as agreeing both with Ansel Keys and the Bible on the dangers of high-fat diets, his scriptural agreement being with the Leviticus passage. It seemed as if the time might come when the medical men of our country would pass on to their fellow citizens the kind of message the Lord of hosts directed Moses to give the children of Israel. Ye shall not eat the fat of the ox, or the sheep, or the goat, the Associated Press story gave such an opening to be flippant that I could not resist writing to Dr. White, then known to me only as a distinguished Harvard medical professor and heart specialist. Because of the university association, I accredited myself to him as an alumnus of the Harvard Divinity School to warn him and the rest of the medics that if they were to decide to endorse the Lord on this particular diet pronouncement, they might find themselves in at least seeming disagreement with the Bible on one or more of its other diet passages, and that they might find a swarm of theologians buzzing around their medical heads, for the Bible often speaks well of fat meats. And then I went on to quote him some fat appreciative passages, such as those my Living on the Fat of the Land chapter of this book. <clears throat> There came by return mail a charming note implying, as Dr. White later makes still clearer, that he was not endorsing the anti-fat people, but merely confirming that for the time being they seemed to be having the best of the argument. He went on to say that we are only at the beginning of our knowledge of what causes various heart and circulatory troubles. Especially was he conscious of our need for more... Especially was he conscious of our need for more knowledge of dietetic matters. And then Dr. White laid himself open. He spoke of wanting to know more of my views and experiences, and that he looked forward to one day reading books of mine. So of course I sent him one, this one. Perhaps two weeks passed, and I felt more strongly what I had realized the moment after I sent the book, that there should be limits to forwardness and jocularity, 
even among fellow alumni of the same university. But then came a four-page, closely handwritten letter from a resort in New Hampshire. Dr. and Mrs. White were there for a rest and were reading my book to each other, perhaps reading themselves to sleep. He was writing me on a few points which he had noted so far, and he wanted my comment. Then followed 18 questions, a few of them with subheads A, B, and occasionally C. I spent two full days pounding out on my typewriter the best answers I could think of to his questions, seven or eight pages, single-spaced. A third letter came. Evidently, we had for discussion more points than a correspondence would handle, and we ought to get together. Would I let him know the next time I came to Boston? By return mail, I said that the hotel we usually stay at in Boston is on the same street with his office, that my wife and I were spending three days there soon because of a day's conference at the Harvard Divinity School on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that perhaps he and I could get together either the day before the conference or the one after. He replied, asking if we would dine at his home the evening before the scrolls lecture. His wife also was interested in the scrolls, he said, and was indeed taking a Bible course at Radcliffe with Mary Ellen Chase, and, by implication, he said we could talk before and after dinner of ancient scrolls and of fat meats. We did more than that, as to the fats. For among the cocktail foods were strips of rare bacon, enveloping bits of pickled melon rind, and at dinner we had marrow bones. What with our Dead Sea Scrolls discussion, the evening reminded us of what the Bible promised to the chosen. A feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow. The wines in our feast being replaced by cocktails. These events, which led to an admiring friendship on my part for Dr. White, led also to his writing a comment for this second edition. It led further both to friendship and to what looks like the beginning of a collaboration with Dr. White's friend and collaborator, Dr. Frederick J. Stair, Chairman, Department of Nutrition, Harvard School of Public Health, who has written a more general and longer comment. July 1956. Next chapter, Introductions. So we're still not even on to the first chapter. There will be an introduction the physiological side by Eugene F. Du Bois, Du Bois, Medical Director of Russell Sage Institute of Pathology, Professor of Physiology, Cornell University Medical College, and the anthropological side by Ernest a. Hooten, Curator of Somatology of the Peabody Museum, Professor of Physical Anthropology in Harvard University. But altogether it's only one, two, three, three basically, four, five, about five pages. All right, that'll be the next video. Hope you enjoyed that comment, <laughs> quite a long comment, uh, longest comment I've ever heard from the author. Catch you on the next one.